Saint Joan, scene one. A fine spring morning on the River Meuse between Lorraine and Champagne in the year 1492 AD in the castle of Vaucouleur. Captain Robert de Baudricourt, a military squire, handsome and physically energetic, but with no will of his own, is disguising that defect in his usual fashion by storming terribly at his steward, who might be any age from 18 to 55, being the sort of man whom age cannot wither because he has never bloomed. The two are in a sunny stone chamber on the first floor of the castle, at a plain, strong oak table seated in chair to match. The captain presents his left profile. The steward stands facing him at the other side of the table, if so deprecatory a stance as his can be called standing. The mullioned 13th century window is open behind him. Near it in the corner is a turret with a narrow arched doorway leading to a winding stair which descends to the courtyard. There is a stout four-legged stool under the table and a wooden chest under the window. No eggs? No eggs? Thousand thunders, man. What do you mean by no eggs? Sir, it is not my fault. It is the act of God. Blasphemy. You tell me there are no eggs, and you blame your maker for it. Sir, what can I do? I cannot lay eggs. Ha! Huh, you jest about it. No, sir, God knows. We all have to go without eggs, just as you have, sir. The hens will not lay. Indeed. Now, listen to me, you. Yes, sir. What am I? What are you, sir? Yes, what am I? Am I Robert? Squire to Bordricourt, and captain of this castle of Vaucouleur, or am I a cowboy? Oh, sir, you know you are a greater man here than the king himself. Precisely. And now, do you know what you are? I am nobody, sir, except that I have the honour to be your steward. You have not only the honour of being my steward, but the privilege of being the worst, most incompetent, drivelling, snivelling, gibbering, jabbering idiot of a steward in France. Yes, sir. Uh, to a great man like you, I must seem like that. My fault, I suppose, eh? No, oh, sir. You always give my most innocent words such a turn. I will give your neck a turn if you dare tell me when I ask you how many eggs there are that you cannot lay any. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. No, not Oh, sir, oh, sir, but no, sir, no, sir, my three Barbary hens and the black are the best layers in Campan. And you come here and tell me that there are no eggs? Who stole them? Tell me that before I kick you out through the castle gate for a liar and a seller of my goods to thieves. The milk was short yesterday, too. Do not forget that. I know, sir, I know only too well. There is no milk, there are no eggs. Tomorrow there will be nothing. Nothing? You will steal the lot, eh? No, sir. Nobody will steal anything. But there is a spell on us. We, we are bewitched. That story is not good enough for me. Robert de Baudricourt burns witches and hangs thieves. Go. Bring me four dozen eggs and two gallons of milk here in this room before noon. Or heaven have mercy on your bones. I'll teach you to make a fool of me. Sir, I tell you there are no eggs. There will be none, not if you were to kill me for it, as long as the maid is at the door. The maid? What maid? What are you talking about? The girl from Lorraine, sir, from Domremy. Thirty thousand thunders, fifty thousand devils. Do you mean to say that that girl who had the impudence to ask to see me two days ago, and whom I told you to send back to her father, with my orders that he was to give her a good hiding, is here still? I have told her to go, sir. She won't. I did not tell her to tell you to, to tell her to go. I told you to throw her out. You have fifty men-at-arms and a dozen lumps of able-bodied servants to carry out my orders. Are they afraid of her? She is so positive, sir. Positive? Now see here, I am going to throw you downstairs. No, sir, please! Well, stop me by being positive. It's quite easy. Any slut of a girl can do it. Sir, sir, you cannot get rid of her by throwing me out. You see, I'm... sir, you are much more positive than I am, but so is she. I am stronger than you are, you fool. No, sir, it isn't that. It's your strong character, sir. She is weaker than we are. She is only a slip of a girl, but we cannot make her go. Parcel of curs. 
You are afraid of her. No, sir, we are afraid of you. But she puts courage into us. She really doesn't seem to be afraid of anything. Perhaps you could uh, frighten her, sir. Perhaps. Where is she now? Down in the courtyard, sir, talking to the soldiers as usual. She is always talking to the soldiers, except when she is praying. Praying? Ha! You believe she prays, you idiot? I know the sort of girl that is always talking to soldiers. She shall talk to me in a bit. Hello! You there! Is it me, sir? Yes, you. Be you captain? Yes, damn your impudence. I be captain. Come up here. Shoo her the way, you, and shove her along quick. She wants to go and be a soldier herself. She wants you to give her soldiers clothes, armour, sir, and a sword. Actually? Joan appears in the turret doorway. She is an able-bodied country girl of 17 or 18, respectively dressed in red, with an uncommon face, eyes very wide apart and bulging as they often do in very imaginative people, a long well-shaped nose with wide nostrils, a short upper lip, resolute but full-lipped mouth, and handsome fighting chin. She comes eagerly to the table, delighted at having penetrated to Baudricourt's presence at last, and full of hope as to the results. His scowl does not check or frighten her in the least. Her voice is normally a hearty, coaxing voice, very confident, very appealing, very hard to resist. Good morning, Captain Squire. Captain, you are to give me a horse and armour and some soldiers, and send me to the Dauphin. Those are your orders from my lord. What is from your lord? And who the devil may your lord be? Go back to him and tell him that I am neither duke nor peer at his orders. I am a squire of Baudricourt, and I take no orders except from the king. Yes, squire, that is all right. My lord is the king of heaven. Why, the girl's mad. Why didn't you tell me so, you blockhead? Sir, do not anger her. Give her what she wants. They all say I am mad until I talk to them, squire. But you see that it's the will of God that you are to do what he has put in my mind. It is the will of God that I shall send you back to your father with orders to put you under lock and key and thrash the madness out of you. What have you to say to that? You think you will, squire, but you will find it all coming quite different. You said you would not see me, but here I am. Yes, sir, you see, sir? Hold your tongue, you. Yes, sir. So you are presuming on my seeing you, are you? Yes, Squire. Now listen to me. I am going to assert myself. Please do, Squire. The horse will cost 16 francs. It is a good deal of money, but I can save it on the armour. I can find a soldier's armour that will fit me quite well enough. I'm very hardy, and I do not need beautiful armour made to my measure like you wear. I shall not want many soldiers. The Dauphin will give me all I need to raise the siege of Orleans. To raise the siege of Orleans? Yes, Squire. That is what God is sending me to do. Three men will be enough for you to send with me if they are good men and gentle to me. They have promised to come with me, Polly and Jack and... Polly? You impudent baggage. You dare to call Squire Bertrand de Polingay Polly to my face? His friends call him so, Squire. I did, I did not know he had any other name. Jack. But that is Monsieur John of Metz, I suppose. Yes, Squire. Jack will come willingly. He is a very kind gentleman, and he gives me money to give to the poor. I think John Godsafe will come, and Dick the Archer, and their servants, John of Honecourt, and Julian. There will be no trouble for you, Squire. I have arranged it all. You, you have only to give the order. Well, I am damned. No, Squire. God is very merciful, and the blessed saints Catherine and Margaret, who speak with me every day, will intercede for you. You will go to paradise, and your name will be remembered forever as my first helper. Is this true about Monsieur de Polingay? Yes, sir, and about Monsieur de Metz, too. They both want to go with her. Hmm. Hello, you there. Send Monsieur de Polingay to me, will you? Get out and wait in the yard. Right, Squire. Go with her, you, you divering imbecile. Stay within call and keep your eye out on her. I shall have her up here again. Do so in God's name, sir. Think of those hens, the best layers in champagne, and... Think of my boot and your backside out of reach of it. The steward retreats hastily after Joan and finds himself confronted in the doorway by Bertrand de Boulanger, 
a lymphatic French gentleman at arms, aged 36 or thereabout, employed in the department of the Provence Marshal, dreamily absent-minded, seldom speaking unless spoken to, and then slow and obstinate in reply, altogether in contrast to the self-assertive, loud-mouthed, superficially energetic, fundamentally willless Robert. The steward makes way for him and vanishes. Boulanger salutes and stands awaiting orders. It is in service, Polly, a friendly talk. Sit down. Boulanger, relaxing, comes into the room, places the stool between the table and the window, and sits down ruminatively. Robert, half sitting on the end of the table, begins the friendly talk. Now listen to me, Polly. I must talk to you like a father. Boulanger looks up at him gravely for a moment, but says nothing. It's about this girl you're interested in. Now I have seen her, I have talked to her. First, she's mad, that doesn't matter. Second, she's not a farm wench, she's a bourgeois. That matters a good deal. I know her class exactly. Her father came here last year to represent his village in a lawsuit. He is one of their notables, a farmer, not a gentleman farmer. He makes money by it and lives by it. Still, not a laborer, not a mechanic. He might have a cousin, a lawyer, or in church. People of this sort may be of no account socially, but they can have a, give a good lot of bother to the authorities. That is to say, to me. Now, no doubt it seems to you a very simple thing to take this girl away, humbugging her into the belief that you are taking her to the Defarm. But if you get her into trouble, you may get me into no end of mess. And as I am her father's lord and responsible for her protection, so friends or no friends, Polly, hands off her. I should as soon think of the Blessed Virgin herself in that way as of this girl. But she says you and Jack and Dick have offered to go with her. What for? You're not going to tell me you are going, you take her crazy notion of going to the Dauphin seriously, are you? There is something about her. They are pretty foul mouthed and foul minded down there in the guard room, some of them. But there hasn't been a word that has anything to do with her being a woman. They have stopped swearing before her. There is. Something. Something. It may be worth trying. Oh, come, Polly. Pull yourself together. Common sense was never your strong point, but this is a little too much. What is the good of common sense? If we have any common sense, we should join the Duke of Burgundy and the English King. They hold half the country right down to the Loire. They have Paris. They have this castle. You know very well that we had to to surrender it to the Duke of Bedford, and that you are only holding it on parole. The Dauphin is in Chinon, like a rat in a corner, except that he won't fight. We don't even know that he is Dauphin. His mother says he isn't, and she ought to know. Think of that, the queen denying the legitimacy of her own son. Well, she married her daughter to the English king. Can you blame the woman? I blame nobody. But, thanks to her, the Dauphin is down and out, and we may as well face it. The English will take Orly. The bastard will not be able to stop them. He beat the English the year before last in Martigui. I was with him. No matter. His men are cowed now, and he can't work miracles. And I tell you that nothing can save our side now but a miracle. Miracles are all right, Polly. The only difference... I used to think so. I am not so sure now. At all events, this is not a time to leave any stone unturned. There is something about the girl. Oh? You think the girl can work miracles, do you? I think the girl herself is a bit of a miracle. Anyhow, she is the last card left in her hand. Better play her now than throw the game. You really think that? Is there anything else left for us to think? Look here, Polly. If you were in my place, would you let a girl like that do you out of 16 francs for a horse? I will pay for the horse. You will? Yeah, I will back my opinion. You will really gamble on a forlorn hope to the tune of 16 francs? It is not a gamble. What else is it? It is a certainty. Her words and her ardent faith in God have put a fire into me. Whew. You are as mad as she is. 
We want a, ma a few mad people now. See where the sane ones have landed us. I shall feel like a precious fool. Still, if you feel sure. I feel sure enough to take it to Chinon, unless you stop me. That is not fair. You are putting the responsibility on me. It is on you, whichever way you decide. Yes, that's just it. Which way am I to decide? You don't see how awkward this is for me. Do you think that I ought to have another talk with her? Yes. Joan! Will you let us go, Polly? Come up, come in. Shall I leave you with her? No, stay here and back me up. Lorne G sits down on the chest. Robert goes back to his magisterial chair, but remains standing to inflate himself more imposingly. Joan comes in full of good news. Jack will go halves on the horse. Well... Sit down, Joan. May I? Do what you are told. Joan curtsies and sits down on the stool between them. Robert outfaces his perplexity with his most peremptory air. What is your name? They always call me Jenny in Lorraine. Here in France, I'm Joan. The soldiers call me the maid. What is your surname? Surname? What is that? My father sometimes calls himself Dark, but I, I know nothing about it. You met my father. He... Yes, yes, I remember. You come from Domnamy in Lorraine, I think. Yes, but what does it matter? We all speak French. Don't ask questions. Answer them. How old are you? Seventeen, so they tell me. It might be nineteen. I, I don't remember. What did you mean when you said that St. Catherine and St. Margaret talk to you every day? They do. What are they like? I will tell you nothing about that. They have not given me leave. But you actually see them, and they talk to you just as I am talking to you? No, it, it's quite different. I cannot tell you. You must not talk to me about my voices. How do you mean, voices? I hear voices telling me what to do. They come from God. They come from your imagination? Of course. That is how the messages of God come to us. Checkmate. No fear. So, God says you are to raise the siege of Orléans. And to crown the Dauphin in Rheims Cathedral. Crown the Dauphin? Gosh. And to make the English leave France. Anything else? Not just at present, thank you, Squire. I suppose you think that raising a siege is as easy as chasing a cow out of the meadow. You think soldiering is anybody's job. I do not think it can be very difficult if God is on your side and you are willing to put your life in his hand. But many soldiers are quite simple. Simple? Did you ever see English soldiers fighting? They are only men. God has made them just like us, but he gave them their own country and their own language, and it is not his will that they should come into our country and try to speak our language. Who has been putting such nonsense into your head? Don't you know that soldiers are subject to their feudal lord, and that it is nothing to them or to you whether he is the Duke <coughs> of Burgundy, or the King of England, or the King of France? What has their language to do with it? I do not understand that a bit. We are all subject to the King of Heaven, and he gave us our countries and our languages and meant us to keep to them. If it were not so, it would be murder to kill an Englishman in battle, and you, Squire, would be in great danger of hellfire. You must not think about your duty to your feudal lord, but to your duty to God. It's no use, Robert. She can choke you like that every time. Can she, by St. Dennis? We shall see. We are not talking about God. We are talking about practical affairs. I ask you again, girl, have you ever seen English soldiers fighting? Have you ever seen them plundering, burning, turning the countryside into a desert? Have you heard no tales of their black prince, who was blacker than a devil himself, or of the English king's father? You must not be afraid, Robert. Damn you, I am not afraid. And who gave you leave to call me Robert? You were called so in church in the name of our Lord. All the other names are your father's or your brother's or anybody's. <sighs> Listen to me, squire. At Donnery, we had to fly to the next village to escape from the English soldiers. Three of them were left behind, wounded. I came to know these three poor goddams quite well. They had not half my strength. 
Do you know why they are called Godams? No. Everyone calls them Godams. It's because they are always willing to, always calling on their god to condemn their souls to perdition. That is what Godam means in their language. How do you like it? God will be merciful to them, and they will act like his good children when they go back to the country he made for them, and made them for. I have heard the tales of the Black Prince. The moment he touched the soil of our country, the devil entered into him and made him a black fiend. But at home, in the place made for him by God, he was good. It was always so. If I went into England against the will of God to conquer England and try to live there and speak its language, the devil would enter into me, and when I was old, I should shudder to remember the wickedness I did. Perhaps. But the more devil you were, the better you might fight. That is why the Godams will take Orléans, and you cannot stop them, nor ten thousand like you. One thousand like me can stop them. Ten like me can stop them with God on our side. You do not understand, Squire. Our soldiers are always beaten because they are fighting only to save their skins, and the shortest way to save your skin is to run away. Our knights are thinking only of the money they will make in ransoms. It is not kill or be killed with them, but pay or be paid. But I will teach them all to fight with the will of God that may be done in France, and then they will drive the poor goddams before them like sheep. You and Polly will live to see the day when there is not an English soldier on the soil of France, and there will be but one king there. Not the feudal English king, but the gods French one. This may all be rot, Polly, but the troops might swallow it. Though nothing that we can say seems to be able to put any fight into them. Even the Dauphin might swallow it. And if she can put a fight into him, she can put it into anybody. I can see no harm in trying, can you? And there is something about the girl. Now, listen you to me, and don't cut in before I have time to think. Yes, Squire. Your orders are that you are to go to Shinon under the escort of this gentleman and three of his friends. Oh, Squire, your head is all circled with light like a saint's. How is she to get into the royal presence? I don't know. How did she get into my presence? If the Dauphin can keep her out, he is a better man than I take him for. I will send her to Chinon, and she can say I sent her. Then let come what may, I can do no more. And the dress? I may have a soldier's dress, mayn't I, Square? Have what you please, I wash my hands of it. Come, Polly. Goodbye, old man. I am taking a big chance. Few other men would have done it. But as you say, there's something about her. Yes, there's something about her. Goodbye. He goes out. Robert, still very doubtful whether he has not been made a fool of by a crazy female <laughs> and a social inferior to boot, scratches his head and slowly comes back from the door. The steward runs in with a basket. Sir, sir. What now? The hens are laying like mad, sir. Five dozen eggs. Christ in heaven. She did come from God. They exit. End of scene. Scene two. Shinon in Torain. At the an end of the throne room in the castle, curtained off to make an antechamber. The Archbishop of the Archbishop of Reims, close on fifty, a full fed prelate with nothing of the ecclesiastic about him except his imposing bearing, and the Lord Chamberlain, Monsignor de la Tremouille, <laughs> a monstrous arrogant wineskin of a man, are waiting for the Dauphin. There is a door in the wall to the right of the two men. It is late in the afternoon on the 8th of March, 1429. The Archbishop stands with dignity, whilst the Chamberlain on his left fumes about in the worst of tempers. What the devil does the Dauphin mean by keeping us waiting like this? I don't know how you have the patience to stand there like a stone idol. No, see, I am the Archbishop, and an Archbishop is a sort of idol. At any rate, he has to learn to keep still and suffer fools patiently. Besides, my dear Lord Chamberlain, it is the Dauphin's royal privilege to keep you waiting, is it not? Dauphin be damned, saving your reverence. Do you know how much money he owes me? No, much more than he owes me. I have no doubt, because you are much richer than that. But I take it that he owes you all you could afford to lend him. That is what he owes me. 
27,000. That was his last haul. A cool 27,000. What becomes of it all? He never had a suit of clothes that I would throw into a curate. Oh, he dines on a chicken or a scrap of mutton. He borrows my last penny, and there is nothing to show for it. Oh, at last. No, my lord, it is not his majesty. Monsieur de Ray is approaching. Oh, young Bluebeard, why announce him? Uh, Captain Lahir is with him. Something has happened, I think. Monsieur de Ray, a young man of 25, very smart and self-possessed, and sporting the extravagance of a little curled beard dyed blue at a clean-shaven court, comes in. He is determined to make himself agreeable, but lacks natural joyousness and is not really pleasant. In fact, when he defies the church some 11 years later, he is accused of trying to extract pleasure from horrible cruelties and hanged. So far, however, there is no shadow of the gallows on him. He advances gaily to the archbishop. The page withdraws. Your faithful lamb, archbishop. Good day, my lord. Dear what has happened to Lahir? He has sworn himself into a fit, perhaps? No, just the opposite. Foulmouth Frank, the only man in Terrain who could beat him at swearing, was told by a soldier that he shouldn't use such language when he was at the point of death. So at any point, but was Foulmouth Frank on the point of death? Yes. He has just fallen into a well and been drowned. The hair is frightened out of his wits. So Captain the hero comes in, a war dog with no court manners and pronounced camp ones. I've just been telling the Chamberlain and the Archbishop. The Archbishop says you are a lost man. Oh, sorry. This is nothing to joke about. It is worse than we are fought. It was not a soldier, but an angel dressed as a soldier. An angel? An angel? Yes, an angel. She has made her way from Champagne with half a dozen men through the thick of everything. Burgundians, goddams, deserters, robbers, and Lord knows who. And they never met a soul except the country folk. I know one of them, the Boulanger. He says she's an angel. If ever I utter an oath again, may my soul be blasted to eternal damnation. Uh, a very pious beginning, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> His Majesty. They stand perfunctorily at court attention. The Dauphin, aged 26, really King Charles VII since the death of his father, but as yet uncrowned, comes in through the curtains with a paper in his hands. He is a poor creature physically, and the current fashion of shaving closely and hiding every scrap of hair under the head covering or headdress, both by women and men, makes the worst of his appearance. He has little narrow eyes, near together a long pendulous nose that droops over his thick, short upper lip, and the expression of a young dog accustomed to be kicked, yet incorrigible and irrepressible. But he is neither vulgar nor stupid, and he has a cheeky humour which enables him to hold his own in conversation. Just at present, he is excited like a child with a new toy. He comes to the Archbishop's left hand. Bluebeard and Lahira retire toward the curtains. Uh, Archbishop, do you know the Robert de Bandit Corps is sending me from Van Couleur? I am not interested in the newest toy. It isn't a toy. However, I can get on very well without your interest. Your Highness has taken offence very unnecessarily. Oh, thank you. You're always ready with a lecture, aren't you? We're not grumbling. What have you got there? What is that to you? It is my business to know what is passing between you and the garrison Vancouver. He snatches the paper from the Dauphin's hand and begins reading it with some difficulty, following the words of his finger and spelling them out syllable by syllable. You all think you can treat me as you please because I owe you money and because I'm no good at fighting, but I have the blood royal in my veins. Even that has been questioned, your highness. One hardly recognises you as the grandson of Charles the Wise. I want to hear no more of my grandfather. He was so wise, he used up the whole family stock of wisdom for five generations and left me the poor fool I am, bullied and insulted by all of you. Oh, control yourself, sir. These outbursts of petulance are not seemly. Another lecture. Thank you. What a pity it is, though you are an archbishop. Saints and angels don't come to see you. What do you mean? Ha! Ask that bully there. Hold your tongue, do you hear? Oh, I hear. You needn't shout. The whole castle can hear. 
Why don't you go and shout at the English and beat them for me? Don't you raise your hand to me. It's high treason. Steady, Duke, steady. Come, come, this will not do. My Lord Chamberlain, please, please. We must keep some sort of order. And you, sir, if you cannot rule your kingdom, at least try to rule yourself. Uh, another lecture, thank you. Yeah, to read this accursed thing for me, he has sent the blood boiling into my head. I can't distinguish the letters. I'll read it for you if you like. I can read, you know. Yes, reading is about all you are fit for. Can you make it out, Archbishop? Uh, I should have expected more common sense from the, the bold report. We are sending some cracked country last here. No, he is sending a saint, an angel, and she is coming to me, to me, the king, and not to you, Archbishop, holy as you are. She knows the blood royal if you don't. You cannot be allowed to see this crazy wench. But I am the king, and I will. Then she cannot be allowed to see you. Now. I tell you, I will. I am going to put my foot down. Her naughty. What would your wise grandfather say? That just shows your ignorance, Bluebeard. My grandfather had a saint he used to float in the air when she was praying, and told him everything he wanted to know. My poor father had two saints, Marie de Mer and Gasca Avignon. It is in our family, and I don't care what you say, I will have my saint too. This creature is not a saint. She is not even a respectable woman. She does not wear women's clothes. She is dressed like a soldier and rides around the country with soldiers. Do you suppose such a person can be admitted into your highness's court? Stop. Did you say a girl in armour, like a soldier? So, the Bora Court described her. But by all the devils in hell. Oh, God, forgive me, what am I saying? By Our Lady and all the saints, this must be the angel that struck foul-mouthed Frank dead for swearing. <laughs> you see? A miracle. Yes, you may strike the lot of us dead if we cross her. For heaven's sake, Archbishop, be careful what you are doing. Now, rubbish. Nobody has been struck dead. A drunken blackguard who is being rebuffed a hundred times for swearing has fallen into a well and been drowned. A mere coincidence. I do not know what a coincidence is. I do know that the man is dead and that she told him he was going to die. Well, we are all going to die, Captain. I hope not. We can easily find out whether she is an angel or not. That is arranged when she comes at that I shall be the Dauphin and see whether she will find me out. Yes, yes, I agree to that. If she cannot find the blood royal, I will have nothing to do with her. It is for the church to make space. Let the court mind his own business and not dare usurp the function of his priest. I say the girl should not be admitted. But, Archbishop... I speak in the church's name. Do you dare say she shall? Um, if you make it an excommunication matter, I have nothing more to say, of course. But you haven't read the end of the letter. D. De Baudricourt says she will raise the siege of Orléans and beat the English for us. Rot! Well, will you save Orléans for us with all your bullying? Do not throw that in my face again, do you hear? I have done more fighting than you ever did or ever will, but I cannot be everywhere. Well, that's something. You have Jack de Noir at the head of your troops in Orléans. The brave de Noir, the handsome de Noir, the wonderful invincible de Noir, the darling of all the ladies, the beautiful bastard. Is it likely that the country lass can do what he cannot do? Why doesn't he raise the siege then? The wind is against him. <laughs> How can the wind hurt him at all? Hour? It is not on the channel. It is on the river of the Loire, and the English hold the bridgehead. He must ship his men across the river and upstream, <coughs> take them in the rear. Well, he cannot, because there is a devil of a wind blowing the other way. He is tired of paying the priest to pray for a west wind. What he needs is a miracle. You tell me that what the girl did to foul mouth Frank was no miracle. No matter. It finished Frank. 
If she changes the wind for Dunois, that may not be a miracle either, but it may finish the English. What harm is there in trying? It is true that Du de Court seems extraordinarily impressed. Du de Court's a blazing ass. But he is a soldier, and if he thinks she can beat the English, all the rest of the army will think so too. Oh, let them have their way. Dunois's men will give up the town the spite of him if somebody does not put some fresh spunk into them. The church must examine the girl before anything decisive is done about her. However, since his highness deserves it, let her attend the court. I will find her and tell her. He goes out. Come with me, Bluebeard. And let us arrange so that she will not know who I am. You will pretend to be me. He goes out through the curtains. Pretend to be that thing. Holy Michael. He follows I the I wonder, dog. will she pick him out? Oh, of course she will. Why? How is she to know? She will know what everyone in Chion knows, that the Dauphin is the meanest looking and worst dressed figure in the court, and that the man with the blue beard is... I never thought of that. You are not so accustomed to miracles as I am. It is part of my profession. But that would not be a miracle at all. No, why not? What? Well, come, 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 what is a miracle? A miracle, my friend, is an event which creates faith. That is the purpose and nature of miracles. They may seem very wonderful to the people who witness them, and very simple to those who perform them. That does not matter. If they confirm or create faith, they are true miracles. Even when they are frauds, do you mean? Frauds deceive. An event which creates faith does not deceive. Therefore, it is not a fraud, but a miracle. Well, I, I suppose you are an archbishop, you must be right. Seems a bit fishy to me, but I am no churchman and don't understand these matters. You are not a churchman, but you are diplomatic and a soldier. Could you make our citizens pay war taxes or our soldiers sacrifice their lives if they knew what is really happening instead of what seems to them to be happening? Uh, no, by Saint-Denis. Uh, the fat would be in the fire before sundown. Would it not be quite easy to tell them the truth? And alive, they wouldn't believe it. Just so. Well, the church has to rule men for the good of their souls, as you have to rule them for the good of their bodies. To do that, the church must do as you do. Nourish their faith by poetry. Poetry? I should call it humbug. You would be wrong, my friend. Parables are not lies because they describe events that have never happened. Miracles are not frauds because they are often, I do not say always, very simple and innocent contravenances by which the priest fortifies the faith of his flock. When this girl picks out the Dauphin among his courtiers, it will not be a miracle for me, because I shall know how it has been done, and my faith will not be increased. But as for others, if they feel the thrill of the supernatural and forget their sinful clay in a sudden sense of the glory of God, it will be a miracle and a blessing. And you will find that the girl herself will be more affected than anyone else. She will forget how she really picked him out. <coughs> I wish I were clever enough to know how much of you is God's archbishop and how much the artful fox in Touraine. But all oh, we shall be late for the fun, and I want to see it, miracle or no miracle. Do not think that I am a lover of crooked ways. There are there is a new spirit rising in men, which we are at the dawning of a wider east. If I were a simple monk and I had no had not to rule men, I should seek peace for my spirit with Aristotle and Pythagoras rather than with the saints and their miracles. And who the deuce is Pythagoras? 
a sage who held that the earth is round and that it moves around the sun. What an utter fool! Couldn't he use his eyes? They go out together through the curtains, which are presently withdrawn, revealing the full depth of the throne room with the court assembled. On the right are two chairs of state on the die. Bluebeard is standing theatrically on the die, playing the king, and like the courtiers, enjoying the joke rather obviously. There is a curtained arch in the wall behind the die, but the main door, guarded by men at arms, is at the other side of the room, and a clear path across is kept and lined by the courtiers. Charles is in this path in the middle of the room. Lahira is on his right. The archbishop on his left has taken his place by the die. La Tremouille at the other side of it. The Duchess de la Tremouille, pretending to be the queen, sits in the consort's chair with a group of ladies in waiting close by behind the archbishop. The chatter of the courtiers makes such a noise that nobody notices the appearance of the page at the door. The Duke of... The Duke of... Attention! The Duke of Vendome presents Joan the Maid to his majesty. Shh! Let her approach the throne. Joan, dressed as a soldier, with her hair bobbed and hanging thickly around her face, is led in by a bashful and speechless nobleman, from whom she detaches herself to stop and look around eagerly for the Dauphin. Did never touch it. My dear, her hair! Shh. Ladies, ladies! I wear it like this because I am a soldier. Where be Dauphin? A titter runs through the court as she walks to the die. You are in the presence of the Dauphin. Joan looks at him sceptically for a moment, scanning him hard up and down to make sure. Dead silence all watching her. Fun dawns in her face. Come, Bluebeard. Thou canst not fool me. Where be Dauphin? A roar of laughter breaks out as you, with a gesture of surrender, joins in the laugh and jumps down from the dive besides that tremor weed. Joan, also on the broad grin, turns back, searching along the row of courtiers, and presently makes a dive and drags out Charles by the arm. Gentle little Dauphin, I am sent to you to drive the English away from Orléans and from France, and to crown you king at the, at the Cathedral of Rheims, where all true kings of France are crowned. You see, all of you, she knew the blood royal, who dare say now that I am not my father's son? But if you want me to be crowned at Reigns, you must talk to the Archbishop, not to me. There he is. Oh, my Lord. My Lord, I am only a poor country girl, and you are filled with the blessedness and glory of God himself. But you will touch me with your hands and give me your blessing, won't you? The old fox blushes. Another miracle. Child, you are in love with religion. Am I? I never thought of that. Is there any harm in it? There is no harm in it, my child, but there is danger. There is always danger, except in heaven. Oh, my Lord, you have given me such strength, such courage. It must be a most wonderful thing to be Archbishop. The court smiles broadly, even titters a little. <laughs> Uh, gentlemen, your levity is rebuffed by this maid's face. I am, God help me, all unworthy. But your mirth is a deadly sin. Their faces fall, dead silence. My lord, we were laughing at her, not with you. Not at you. What? what? Not at my unworthiness, but at her face? God arranged his maid prophesied that the blasphemer should be drowned in his sin. No! Uh, I prophesy now that you will be hanged in York if you do not learn when to laugh and when to pray. My lord, I stand rebuked. I am sorry. I can say no more. But if you prophesy that I shall be hanged... I shall never be able to resist temptation, because I shall always be telling myself that I may as well be hanged for a sheep as a lamb. The courtiers take heart in this. <laughs> there is more tittering. You are an idle hmm. fellow, Bluebeard, and you have great impudence to answer the Archbishop. Well said, lass, well said. <laughs> oh, my lord, will you send all these silly folks away so I may speak to the Dauphin alone? I can take a hint. He salutes, turns on his heel, and goes out. Come, gentlemen, the maid comes with God's blessing and must be obeyed. 
The courtiers withdraw, some through the arch, others at the opposite side. The archbishop marches across to the door, followed by the duchess and the tremouille. As the archbishop passes Joan, she falls on her knees and kisses the hem of his robe fervently. He shakes his head in instinctive remonstrance, gathers the robe from her, and goes out. She is left kneeling directly in the duchess's way. Can you allow me to pass, please? Beg pardon, ma'am, I'm sure. The duchess passes on. Joan stares after her, then whispers to the Dauphin. Be that queen? No, she thinks she is. Ooh. <laughs> I'll trouble your highness not to jibe at my wife. He goes out. The others have already gone. Who be old Gruff and Grum? He is the Duke of the Tremoli. What be his job? Uh, he pretends to command the army, and whether I find a friend I can care for, he kills him. Why dost let him? How can I prevent him? He bullies me. They all bully me. Art afraid? Yes, I am afraid. It's no use preaching to me about it. It's all very well for these big men with their armour that's too heavy for me, and their swords that I can hardly lift and their muscles, and their shouting, and their bad tempers. They like fighting. Most of them are making fools of themselves all the time. They are not fighting. But I am quiet and sensible, and I don't want to kill people. I only want to be left alone to enjoy myself in my own way. I never asked to be a king. It was pushed on me. So if you're going to say, son of Saint Louis, gird on the sword of your ancestors and lead us to victory, you may spare your breath and cool your porridge, for I cannot do it. I am not built that way, and there is an end of it. Oh, Blethers, we are all like that to begin with. I shall put courage into thee. But I don't want to have courage put into me. I want to sleep in a comfortable bed and not live in continual terror of being killed or wounded. Put courage into the others and let them have their belly full of fighting, but let me alone. It's no use, Charlie. Thou must face what God puts on thee. If thou fail to make thyself king, thou'lt be a beggar, and what else art fit for? Come, let me see thee sitting on the throne. I have looked forward to that. What is the good of sitting on the throne when the other fellows can give all the orders? However, here is the king for you. Look your fill at the poor devil. Thou art not king yet, lad. Thou art but dauphin. Be not led away by them about around thee. Dressing up don't fill empty noddle. I know the people, the real people that make thy bread for thee. And I tell thee, they count no man king of France until the holy oil has been poured on his hair and himself consecrated and crowned in the Rems Cathedral. And thou needst new clothes, Charlie. Why does not Queen look after thee properly? Oh, we're too poor. She wants all the money we can spare to put on her own back. Besides, I like to see her beautifully dressed and I don't care what I wear myself. I should look ugly anyhow. <laughs> there is some good in thee, Charlie, but it's not yet a king's good. We shall see. I am not such a fool as I look. I have my eyes open, and I can tell you that one good treaty is worth ten good fights. These fighting fellows lose all on the treaties that they gain on the fights. If we can only have a treaty, the English are sure to have the worst of it, because they are better at fighting than at thinking. If the English win, it is they that will make the treaty, and then God help poor France. Thou must fight, Charlie, whether thou will or no. I will go first to heart in thee. We must take our courage in both hands, I, and pray for it with both hands too. Oh, do stop talking about God and praying. I can't bear people who are always praying. Isn't it bad enough to have to do it at the proper times? Thou poor child. Thou hast never prayed in thy life. I must teach thee from the beginning. I am not a child. I am a grown man and a father, and I will not be taught any more. Aye, you have a little son. He that will be Louis the Eleventh when you die. Would you not fight for him? No. A horrid boy. He hates me. He hates everybody, selfish little beast. I don't want to be bothered with children. I don't want to be a father. I don't want to be a son, especially a son of Saint Louis. I don't want to be any of these fine things you have your heads full of. I want to be just what I am. Why can't you mind your own business and let me mind mine? Minding your own business is like minding your own body. It's the shortest way to make yourself sick. What is my business? Having mother at home, what is thine, petting lapdogs and sucking sugar sticks? I call that muck. I tell thee it is God's business we are here to do, not our own. I have a message to thee from God, and thou must listen to it, though thou, though thou heart break with the terror of it. 
I don't want a message. But can you tell me any secrets? Can you do any cures? Can you turn lead into gold or any of that sort? I can turn thee into a king in Rem's Cathedral, and that is a miracle that will take some doing, it seems. Yeah, if we go to Rheims and have a coronation, Anne will want new dresses. We can't afford them. I'm all right as I am. As you are? And what is that? Less than my father's poorest shepherd. Thou art not lawful owner of thy own land in France till thou be consecrated. But I shall not be lawful owner of my land anyhow. Will the consecration pay off my mortgages? I have pledged my last acre to the archbishop and that fat bully. I, mo I owe money even to Bluebeard. Charlie, I come from the land and have gotten my strength working on the land and I tell thee that the land is thine to rule righteously and keep God's peace in. And not so pledge at the pawn shop as a drunken woman pledges her children's clothes. I come from God to tell thee to kneel in the cathedral and solemnly give thy kingdom to him forever and ever and become the greatest king in the world as his steward and his bailiff, his soldier and his servant. The very clay of France will become holy. Her, her soldiers will be the soldiers of God. The rebel dukes will be rebels against God. The English will fall on their knees and beg thee, let them return to their lawful homes in peace. Wilt be a poor little Judas and betray me and him that sent me? Oh, if I only dare. I shall dare, dare, and dare again in God's name. Art for or against me? I'll risk it. I warn you, I shan't be able to keep it up, but I'll risk it. You shall see. Hello, come back, everybody. Mind you, stand by and don't let me be bullied. Come along with you, the whole court. Now I'm in for it, but no matter, here goes. Call for silence, you little beast, will you? <clears throat> Silence for His Majesty the King. The King speaks. Will you be silent there? I have given the command of the army to the maid. The maid is to do as she likes with it. General amazement. The hero, delighted, slaps his steel five piece of his gauntlet. What is this? I command the army! Joan quickly puts her hand on Charles's shoulder as he instinctively recoils. Charles, with a grotesque effort culminating in an extravagant gesture, snaps his fingers in the Chamberlain's face. That answered, old Gruffin Grum. Who is, for, who is for God and his maid? Who is for Orléans with me? For God and his maid! To Orléans! To Orléans! To Orléans! Oh. Joan, radiant, falls on her knees in thanksgiving to God. They all kneel, except the Archbishop, who gives his benediction with a sigh, and that Tremouille, who collapses, cursing. End oh, of <laughs> Scene 3. Orléans, 29th of April, 1429. Dunois, aged 26, is pacing up and down a patch of ground on the south bank of the Silver Loire, <clears> commanding <throat> a long view of the river in both directions. He has had his lance stuck up with a pen on, which streams in a strong east wind. His shield with its bend sinister lies beside it. He has his commander's baton in his hand. He is well built, carrying his armor easily. His broad brow, brow and pointed chin give him an equilaterally triangular face, already marked by active service and responsibility. With the expression of a good-natured and capable man who has no affectations and no foolish illusions, his page is sitting on the ground, elbows on knees, cheeks on fists, idly watching the water. It is evening, and both man and boy are affected by the loveliness of the Loire. Uh, west wind, west wind, west wind. Strumpet. Steadfast when you should be wanton, wanton when you should be steadfast. West wind on the silver Loire. What rhymes to Loire? Oh, change, curse you! Change, English harlot of a wind! Change! West, west, I tell you! <sighs> west wind, wanton wind, willful wind, womanish wind, false wind from over the water, will you never blow again? See? There! There she goes! Where? Who? The maid? No, the kingfisher. Like blue lightning, she went into that bush. Oh, is that all, you infernal young idiot? I have a mind to pitch you into the river. <laughs> it looked frightfully jolly, that flash of blue. Oh, look, there goes the other. Where? Where? Passing the reeds. I see. They follow the flight till the bird takes cover. 
You blew me up because you were not in time to see them yesterday. You knew I was expecting the maid when you set up your yelping. I will give you something to yelp for next time. Aren't they lovely? I wish I could catch them. Let me catch you trying to trap them, and I will put you in the iron cage for a month to teach you what a cage feels like. You are an abominable boy. <laughs> bluebird, bluebird, since I am a friend to thee, change thou the wind for me. No, it does not rhyme. He who has sinned for thee. Ah, that's better. No sense in it, though. Oh, you abominable boy. Mary in the blue snood, kingfisher colour. Will you grudge me a west wind? Halt! Who goes there? The maid. Well, let her pass. Hither, maid, to me! Joan in splendid armour rushes in in a blazing rage. The wind drops and the pennon flaps idly down the lance, but Dunois is too much occupied with Joan to notice it. Be you bastards of Orleans. You see the bend sinister. Are you Joan the maid? Sure. Where are your troops? Miles behind. They have cheated me. They have brought me to the wrong side of the river. I told them to. Why did you? The English are on the other side. The English are on both sides. But Orlean is on the other side. We must fight the English there. How can we cross the river? There is a bridge. In God's name, then, let us cross the bridge and fall on them. It seems simple, but it cannot be done. Who says so? I say so. And older and wiser heads than mine are of the same opinion. Then your older and wiser heads are fat heads. They have made a fool of you. And now they want to make a fool of me too, bringing me to the wrong side of the river. Do you not know that I bring you better help than ever came to any general or any town? Your own? No. The help and counsel of the king in heaven. Which is the way to the bridge? You are impatient, maid. Is this a time for patience? Our enemy is at our gates and here we stand doing nothing. Oh, why are you not fighting? Listen to me, I will deliver you from fear. I... <laughs> no, no, my girl. If you delivered me from fear, I should be a good knight for a storybook, but a very bad commander of the army. Come, let me begin to make a soldier of you. Do you see those two forts at this end of the bridge? The big ones? Yes. Are they ours or the goddams? Be quiet and listen to me. If I were in either of those forts with only ten men, I could hold it against an army. The English have more than ten times ten goddams in those forts to hold them against us. They cannot hold them against God. God did not give them the land under those for forts. They stole it from him. He gave it to us. I will take those forts. Single-handed? Our men will take them. I will lead them. Not a man will follow you. I will not look back to see whether anyone is following me. <laughs> Good. You have the makings of a soldier in you. You are in love with war. Oh, and the Archbishop said I was in love with religion. I, God forgive me, I'm a little in love with war myself, the ugly devil. I'm like a man with two wives. Do you want to be like a woman with two husbands? I will never take a husband. A man in tool took an action against me for breach of promise, but I never promised him. I am a soldier. I do not want to be thought of as a woman. I will not dress as a woman. I do not care for the things women care for. They dream of lovers and of money. I dream of leading a charge and of placing the big guns. You soldiers do not know how to use the big guns. You think you can win battles with great noise and smoke. True. Half the time the artillery was more trouble than it is worth. Aye, lad. You cannot fight stone walls with horses. You must have guns. And much bigger guns, too. Aye, lass. But a good heart and a stout ladder will get over the stoniest wall. I will be the first up the ladder when we've reached the fort, bastard. I dare you to follow me. You must not dare a staff officer, Joan. Only company officers are allowed to indulge in displays of personal courage. Besides, you must know that I welcome you as a saint, not as a soldier. I have daredevils enough at my call, if they could help me. I'm not a daredevil. I'm a servant of God. My sword is sacred. I found it behind the altar in the church of St. Catherine, where God hid it for me, and I may not strike a blow with it. My heart is full of courage, not of anger. I will lead, and your men will follow. That is all I can do. 
but I must do it and you shall not stop me. All in good time. Our men cannot take those forts by a sally across the bridge. They must come by water and take the English in the rear on this side. Then make rafts and put big guns on them and let your men cross to us. The rafts are ready and the men are embarked, but they must wait for God. What do you mean? God is waiting for them. Well, let him send us a wind then. My boats are downstream. They cannot come up against both wind and current. We must wait until God changes the wind. Come, let me take you to the church. No. I love church, but the English will not yield to prayers. They understand nothing but hard knocks and slashes. I will not go to church until we have beaten them. You must. I have business for you there. What business? To pray for a west wind. I have prayed and I have given two silver candlesticks, but my prayers are not answered. Yours may be. You are young and innocent. Oh yes, you are right. I will pray. I will tell St. Catherine. She will make God give, give us a west wind. Quick, show me the way to the church. <laughs> God bless you, child. Come, bless, come, bastard. They go out. The page rises to follow. He picks up the shield and is taking the spear as well when he notices the pennon, which is now streaming eastward. Senor! Senor! Mademoiselle! Oh, what is it? The kingfisher? Oh, a kingfisher? Where? No, 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 the, the wind! The wind! The wind! That is what made me sneeze! The wind has changed. God has spoken. You command the king's army. I am your soldier. The boats have put off then, ripping upstream like anything. Now for the forts. You dared me to follow. Dare you leave? Dunois, dear comrade in arms, help me. My eyes are blinded with tears. Set my foot on the ladder and say, up, Joan. Oh, never mind the tears. Make for the flash of the guns. Ah. Uh. For God and Saint Denis. The maid, the maid, God and the maid, hooray! He snatches up the shield and lance and capers out after them, <laughs> mad with excitement. End of scene. Scene four. A tent in the English camp. A bull-necked English chaplain of 50 is sitting on a stool at a table, hard at work writing. At the other side of the table, an imposing nobleman, aged 46, is seated in a handsome chair, turning over the leaves of an illuminated book of hours. The nobleman is enjoying himself. The chaplain is struggling with suppressed wrath. There is an unoccupied leather stool on the nobleman's left. The table is on his right. Now, this is what I call workmanship. There is nothing on earth more exquisite than a bonny book with well-placed columns of rich black writing and beautiful borders and illuminated pictures cunningly inset. But nowadays, instead of looking at books, people read them. A book might as well be one of those orders for bacon and bran that you were scribbling. I must say, my lord, you take our situation very coolly. Very coolly indeed. What is the matter? The matter, my lord, is that we English have been defeated. That happens, you know. It is only in history books and ballads that the enemy is always defeated. But we are being defeated over and over again. First Orléans? Oh, la. I know what you're going to say, my lord, but that was a clear case that that was a clear case of witchcraft and sorcery. But we're still being defeated. Yargo, Mien, Beaugency, just like Orleans. And now we've been butchered at Pate and Sir John Talbot taken prisoner. I feel it, my lord. I feel it very deeply. I cannot bear to see my countrymen defeated by a parcel of foreigners. Oh, you are an Englishman, are you? Certainly not, my lord. I'm a gentleman. Still, like your lordship, I was born in England, and it makes a difference. You are attached to the soil, eh? It pleases your lord to be satirical at my expense. Your greatest greatness privileges you to be so with impunity. But your lordship knows very well that I am not attached to the soil in a vulgar manner, manner like a serf. Still, I have a feeling about it, and I am not ashamed of it. And by God, if the, this goes on any longer, I will fling my cassock to the devil and take arms myself and strangle the accursed witch with my own hands. So you shall, chaplain, so you shall, if we can do nothing better. But not yet. Not quite yet. The chaplain resumes his seat very sulkily. 
I should not care very much about the witch. You see, I have made my pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and the heavenly powers, by their own credit, can hardly allow me to be worsted by a village sorceress. But the bastard of Orlan is a harder nut to crack, and he has been to the Holy Land too. Honours are easy between us as far as that goes. He is only a Frenchman, my lord. A Frenchman? Why did you pick up that expression? Are these Burgundians and Bretons and Picards and Gascons beginning to call themselves Frenchmen, just as our fellows are beginning to call themselves Englishmen? They actually talk of France and England as their countries. Theirs, if you please. What is to become of me and you if that way of thinking comes into fashion? Why, my lord? Can it hurt us? Men cannot serve two masters. If this can't of serving their country once takes hold of them, goodbye to the authority of their feudal lords, and goodbye to the authority of the church. That is, goodbye to you and me. I hope I am a faithful servant to the church and that there are only six cousins between me and the barony of St Storgenberg, which was created by the conqueror. But is there any reason why I should stand by and see Englishmen beat by a Briton by a French bastard and a witch from lousy Champagne? Easy, man, easy. We shall burn the witch and beat the bastard all in good time. Indeed, I am waiting at present for the Bishop of Beauvais to arrange the burning with him. He has been turned out of his diocese by her faction. You have first to catch her, my lord. Or buy her. I will offer a king's ransom. A king's ransom? For that slut? One has to leave a margin. Some of Charles's people will sell her to the Burgundians. The Burgundians will sell her to us. And there will probably be three or four middlemen who will expect their little commissions. Monstrous. It is all those scoundrels of Jews. They get in every time money changes hands. I would not leave a Jew alive in Christendom if I had my way. Why not? The Jews generally give value. They make you pay, but they deliver the goods. In my experience, the men who want some, something for nothing are invariably Christians. A page appears. The right reverend, the Bishop of Beauvais, Monsignor Cochon. Cochon, aged about 60, comes in. The page withdraws. The two Englishmen rise. My dear Bishop, how good of you to come. Allow me to introduce myself. Richard de Beecham, Earl of Warwick at your service. Your lordship's fame is well known to me. This reverend cleric is Master John de Stogumber. John Bowyer Spencer Neville de Stogumber, at your service, my lord. Bachelor of Theology and Keeper of the Private Seal to His Eminence, the Cardinal of Winchester. You call him the Cardinal of England, I believe, our king's uncle. Messiah John de Stogumber, I'm always a very good friend of His Eminence. Do me the honour of being seated. He gives Koshan his chair, placing it at the head of the table. Koshan accepts a place of honour with a grave inclination. Warwick fetches the lever stool carelessly and sits in his former place. The chaplain goes back to his chair. Low Warwick has taken second place in calculated deference to the bishop. He assumes the lead in opening the proceedings as a matter of course. He is still cordial and expansive, but there is a new note in his voice, which means that he is coming to business. Well, my Lord Bishop. You find us in one of our unlucky moments. Charles is to be crowned at Rennes, practically by the young woman from Lorraine. And I must not deceive you nor flatter your hopes. We cannot prevent it. I suppose it will make a great difference to Charles's position. Undoubtedly. It is a masterstroke of the maids. We were not fairly beaten, my lord. No Englishman is ever fairly beaten. Koshan raises his eyebrows slightly, then quickly composes his face. Our friend here takes the view that the young woman is a sorceress. It would, I presume, be the duty of your reverend lordship to denounce her to the Inquisition and have her burnt for that offence. If she were captured in my diocese, yes. Just so. Now, I suppose there can be no reasonable doubt that she is a sorceress. Not at the least. An arrant witch. We are asking for the bishop's opinion, Messiah John. <clears throat> we shall have to consider not merely our own opinions here, but the opinions, the prejudices, if you like, 
of a French court. A Catholic court, my lord. Catholic courts are composed of mortal men, like other courts, however sacred their function and inspiration may be. And if the men are Frenchmen, as the modern fashion calls them, I am afraid the bare fact that an English army has been defeated by a French one will not convince them that there is any sorcery in the matter. What? Not when the famous Sir Talbot himself has been defeated and actually taken prisoner by a drab from the ditches of Lorraine. Sir John Talbot, we all know, is a fierce and formidable soldier, sire. But I've yet to learn that he is an able general. And though it pleases you to say that he has been defeated by this girl, some of us may be disposed to give a little of the credit to the noir. The bastard of Orléans. Let me remind. I know what you were going to say, my lord. Dunois defeated me at Montagy. I take that as evidence that the Seigneur de Noir is a very able commander indeed. Your lordship is the flower of courtesy. I admit on our side that Talbot is a mere fighting animal, and that it probably served him right to be taken at Pate. My lord, at Orleans this woman had her throat pierced by an English arrow, and was seen to cry like a child from the pain of it. It was a death wound, yet she fought all day. And when our men had repulsed all her attacks like true Englishmen, she walked alone to the wall of our fort with a white banner in her hand. And our men were paralyzed and could neither shoot nor strike whilst the French fell on them and drove them onto the bridge, which immediately burst into flames and crumbled underneath them, letting them drown into the river where they were drowned in heaps. Was this your bastard's generalship? Or were those flames the flames of hell conjured up by witchcraft? You will forgive Messiah John's vehemence, my lord, but he has put our case. Dunois is a great captain, we admit, but why could he do nothing until the witch came? I do not say that there are no supernatural powers on her side, but the names on that white banner were not the names of Satan and Beelzebub, but the blessed names of our Lord and his Holy Mother. And your commander who was drowned, Gladda, I think you call him. Uh... Glasdale. Sir William Glasdale. Oh, Glasdale. Thank you. He was no saint, and many of our people think that he was drowned for his blasphemies against the maid. Well, what are we to infer from all this, my lord? Has the maid converted you? If she had, my lord, I should have known better than to have trusted myself here within your grasp. Oh, oh, my lord! If the devil is making use of this girl, and I believe he is... Ah, you hear, Messiah John? I knew your lordship would not fail us. Pardon my interruption. Proceed. If it be so, the devil has longer views than you give him credit for. Indeed. In what way? Listen to this, Messiah John. If the devil wanted to damn the country girl, do you think so easy a task would cost him the winning of half a dozen battles? No, my lord. <laughs> Any trumpery imp could do that much if the girl could be damned at all. The Prince of Darkness does not condescend to such cheap drudgery. When he strikes, he strikes at the Catholic Church, whose realm is the whole spiritual world. When he damns, he damns the souls of the entire human race. Against that dreadful design, the church stands ever on guard. And it is as one of the instruments of that design that I see this girl. She is inspired, but diabolically inspired. I told you she was a witch. She is not a witch. She is a heretic. What difference would that make? You, a priest, ask me that. You, English, are strangely blunt in the mind. All these things that you call witchcraft are capable of a natural explanation. The woman's miracles were not imposed on a rabbit. She does not claim them as miracles herself. What do her victories prove but that she has a better head on her shoulders than your swearing Glassdales and mad bald Talbots, and that the courage of faith, even though it be a false faith, will always outstay the courage of wrath. 
Hmm? Does your lordship compare St. John, Sir John Talbot, three times governor of Ireland, to a mad bull? It would not be seemly for you to do so, Messiah John, as you are still six removes from a barony. But as I am an earl and Talbot is only a knight, I may make bold to accept the comparison. My lord, I wipe the slate as far as the witchcraft goes. Nonetheless, we must burn the woman. I cannot burn her. The church cannot take life, and my first duty is to seek this girl's salvation. Oh, no doubt. But you do burn people occasionally. No. When the church cuts off the obstinate heretic as a dead branch from the tree of life, the heretic is handed over to the secular arm. The church has no part in what the secular arm may see fit to do. Precisely. And I shall be the secular arm in this case. Well, my lord, hand over your dead branch, and I will see that the fire is ready for it. If you will answer for the church's part, I will answer for the secular part. I can answer for nothing. You great lords are too prone to treat the church as a mere political convenience. Not in England, I assure you. In England more than anywhere else. No, my lord. The soul of this village girl is of equal value with yours or your king's before the throne of God, and my first duty is to save it. I will not suffer your lordship to smile at me as if I were repeating a meaningless form of words, and if it were well understood between us that I should betray the girl to you. I am no mere political bishop. My faith is to me what your honour is to you. And if there be a loophole through which this baptized child of God can creep to her salvation, I shall guide her to it. You are a traitor. You lie, priest. If you dare do what this woman has done, set your country above the holy Catholic Church, you shall go to the fire with her. My lord, I, I went too far. I... My lord. I apologise to you for the word used by Messiah John de Stock Ember. It does not mean in England what it does in France. In your language, traitor means betrayer, one who is perfidious, treacherous, unfaithful, disloyal. In our country, it means simply one who is not wholly devoted to our English interests. Uh, I am sorry. I did not understand. <clears throat> I must apologise on my own account if I have seemed to take the burning of this poor girl too lightly. When one has seen whole countrysides burnt over and over again as mere items in military routine, one has to grow a very thick skin. Otherwise, one might go mad. At all events, I should. I venture to assume that your lordship also, having to see so many heretics burnt from time to time, is compelled to take shall I say, a professional view of what would otherwise be a very horrible incident. Yes, it is a painful duty, even as you say, a horrible one. But in comparison with the horror of heresy, it is less than nothing. I am not thinking of this girl's body, which will suffer for a few moments only, and which must in any event die in some more or less painful manner, but of her soul which may suffer to all eternity. Just so. And God grant that her soul may be saved. But the practical problem would seem to be how to save her soul without saving her body. For we, for we must face it, my lord. If this cult of the maid goes on, our cause is lost. May I speak, my lord? Really, Messiah John, I'd rather you did not, unless you can keep your temper. It is only this. I speak under correction, but the maid is full of deceit. She, she pretends to be devout. Her prayers and confessions are endless. How can she be accused of heresy when she neglects no observance of a faithful daughter of the church? A faithful daughter of the church? The Pope himself at his proudest dare not presume as this woman presumes. She acts as if she herself were the church. She brings the message of God to Charles, and the church must stand aside. She will crown him in the Cathedral of Rennes. She, not the church. 
she sends letters to the king of England, giving him God's command through her to return to his island on pain of God's vengeance, which she will execute. Let me tell you that the writing of such letters was the practice of the accursed Mohammed, the Antichrist. Has she ever in all her utterances said one word of the church? Never. It is always God and herself. What can you expect? A beggar on horseback? Her head is turned. Who has turned it? The devil. And for a mighty purpose. He is spreading this heresy everywhere. The man Huss, burnt only 13 years ago at Constance, infected all Bohemia with it. A man named Wycliffe, himself an anointed priest, spread the pestilence in England, and to your shame you let him die in his bed. We have such people here in France too. I know the breed. It is cancerous. If it be not cut out, stamped out, burnt out, it will not stop until it has brought the whole body of human society into sin and corruption, into waste and ruin. By it, an Arab camel driver drove Christ and his church out of Jerusalem and ravished his way west like a wild beast until at last there stood only the pioneers and God's mercy between France and damnation. Yet what did the camel driver do in the beginning more than this shepherd girl is doing? He had his voices for the angel Gabriel. She has her voices from St. Catherine and St. Margaret and the blessed Michael. He declared himself the messenger of God and wrote in God's name to the kings of the earth. Her letters to them are going forth daily. It is not the mother of God now to whom we must look for intercession, but to Joan the maid. What will the world be like when the church has accumulated wisdom and knowledge and experience, its councils of learned, venerable, pious men are thrust into the kennel by any ignorant labourer or dairy maid whom the devil can puff up with the monstrous self-conceit of being directly inspired from heaven? It will be a world of blood, of fury, of devastation, of each man striving for his own hand. In the end, a world wrecked back into barbarism. For now you have only Mohammed and his dupes, and the maid and her dupes. But what will it be when every girl thinks herself a Joan, and every man a Mohammed? I shudder to the very marrow of my bones when I think of it. I have fought it all my life, and I will fight it to the end. Let all this woman's sins be forgiven her, except only this sin, for it is a sin against the Holy Ghost. And if she does not recant in the dust before the world and submit herself to the last itch of her soul to the church, to the fire she shall go if she once falls into my hand. You feel strongly about it, naturally. Do not you? I am a soldier. Not a churchman. As a pilgrim, I saw something of the Mohammedans. They were not so ill-bred as I had been led to believe. In some respects, their conduct compared favourably with ours. I've noticed this before. Men go to the East to convert the infidels, and the infidels pervert them. The crusader comes back more than half a Saracen, not to mention that all Englishmen are born heretics. Englishman heretics. My lord, must we endure this? His lordship is beside himself. How can what Englishman believes be heresy? It is a contradiction in terms. I absolve you, Monsieur de Stockenberg, on the ground of invincible ignorance. The thick air of your country does not breed theologians. You would not say so if you heard us quarrelling about religion, my lord. I am sorry you think I must be either a heretic or a blockhead, because as a travelled man I know that the followers of Mohammed prof profess great respect for our Lord and are more ready to forgive St. Peter for being a fisherman than your Lordship is to forgive Mohammed for being a camel driver. But at least we can proceed in this matter without bigotry. When men call the zeal of a Christian church bigotry, I know what to think. They are only East and West views of the same thing. 
Only east and west. <laughs> Only. Oh, my Lord Bishop, I'm not gainsaying you. You will carry the church with you, but you have to carry the nobles also. To my mind, there is a stronger case against the maid than the one you have so forcibly put. Frankly, I am not afraid of this girl becoming another Mohammed and superseding the church by a great heresy. I think you exaggerate that risk. But have you noticed that, the, that in these letters of hers, she proposes to all the kings of Europe, and she has already pressed on Charles, a transaction which would wreck the whole social structure of Christendom? Wreck the church, I tell you so. My lord, pray get the church out of your head for a moment. And remember that there are temporal institutions in the world as well as spiritual ones. I and my peers represent the feudal aristocracy as you represent the church. We are the temporal power. Well, do you not see how this girl's idea strikes at us? How does her idea strike you, except as it strikes at all of us, through the church? Her idea is that the kings should give their realms to God and then reign as God's bailiffs. Quite sound theologically, my lord, but uh, the king will hardly care, provided he reign. It is an abstract idea, a mere form of words. By no means. It is a cunning device to supersede the aristocracy and make the king sole and absolute autocrat. Instead of the king being merely the first among his peers, he becomes their master. That we cannot suffer. We call no man master. Nominally, we hold our lands and dignities from the king because there must be a keystone to the arch of human society. But we hold our lands in our own hands and defend them with our own swords and those of our own tents. Now, by the maid's doctrine, the king will take our lands, our lands, and make them a present to God, and God will then vest them wholly in the king. Need you fear that? You are the makers of kings, after all. York or Lancaster in England, Lancaster or Valois in France, they reign according to your pleasure. Yes, but only as long as the people follow their feudal lords, and know the king only as a travelling show owning nothing but the highway that belongs to everybody. If the people's thoughts and hearts were turned to the king, and their lords became only the king's servants in their eyes, the king could break us across his knee one by one. And then what should we be but liveried courteous in his halls? Still you need not fear, my lord. Some men are born kings, and some are born statesmen. The two are seldom the same. Where would the king find counsellors to plan and carry out such a policy for him? Hmm? Perhaps in the church, my lord. Koshan, with an equally sour smile, shrugs his shoulders and does not contradict him. Strike down the barons, and the cardinals will have it all their own way. My lord, we shall not defeat the maid if we strive against one another. I know well that, that uh, there is a will to power in the world. I know that while it lasts, there will be a struggle between the emperor and the pope, between the dukes and the political cardinals, between the barons and the kings. The devil divides us and governs. I see you are no friends to the church. You are an earl first and last, as I am a churchman first and last. But can we not sink our differences in the face of a common enemy? I see now that what is in your mind is not that this girl has never once mentioned the church and thinks only of God and herself, but that she has never once mentioned the peerage and thinks only of the king and herself. Quite so. These two ideas of hers are the same idea at bottom. Goes deep, my lord. It is the protest of the individual soul against the interference of priest or peer between the private man and his God. I should call it Protestantism if I had to find a name for it. You understand it wonderfully well, my lord. Scratch an Englishman and find a Protestant.
I think you are not entirely void of sympathy with the maid's secular heresy, my lord. I leave you to find a name for it. You mistake me, my lord. I have no sympathy with her political presumptions. But as a priest, I have gained a knowledge of the minds of the common people. And there you will find yet another most dangerous idea. I can only express it by such phrases as France for the French, England for the English, Italy for the Italians, Spain for the Spanish, and so forth. It is sometimes so narrow and bitter in country folk that it surprises me that this country girl can rise above the idea of her village for its villages. But she can. She does. When she threatens to drive the English from the soil of France, she is undoubtedly thinking of the whole extent of country in which French is spoken. To her, the French-speaking people are what the Holy Scriptures describe as a nation. Call this side of her heresy nationalism, if you will. I can find you no better name for it. I can only tell you that it is essentially anti-Catholic and anti-Christian. The Catholic Church knows only one realm, and that is the realm of Christ's kingdom. Divide that kingdom into nations and you dethrone Christ. Dethrone Christ and who will stand between our throats and the sword? The world will perish in a welter of war. Well, if you will burn the Protestant, I will burn the Nationalist. Though perhaps I shall not carry Messiah John with me there. England for the English will appeal to him. Certainly so. England for the English goes without saying. It is the simplest law of nature. But this woman denies to England her legitimate conquests given her by God because of her peculiar fitness to rule over less civilised races for their own good. I do not understand what your lordship means by Protestant and nationalist. You're too, le too learned and subtle for a poor clerk like myself. But I know as a matter of plain common sense that the woman is a rebel and that is enough for me. She rebels against nature by wearing man's clothes and fighting. She rebels against the church by usurping the divine authority of the Pope. She rebels against God by her damnable league with Satan and his evil spirits against our army. And all these rebellions are only excuses for her great rebellion against England. That is not to be endured. Let her perish. Let her burn. Let her not infect the whole flock. It is expedient that one woman die for the people. My lord, we seem to be agreed. I will not imperil my soul. I will uphold the justice of the church. I will strive to the utmost for this woman's salvation. I am sorry for the poor girl. I hate these severities. I will spare her if I can. I would burn her with my own hands. Sancta simplicitas. End of scene.